thank you. It's, it's a privilege to be here the um, last couple of days. Uh, I've learned more about containers than I ever thought possible. Um, at any rate, I'm going to talk to you about a competition that uh, my firm um, won where, we, where containers weren't necessarily a part of it to begin with, but we used a, a, a design and planning competition um, to explore um, opportunities with containers. And I'll talk a little bit about what we learned from that analysis, but also um, and, um, the interest that, that evolved from that, that we're, we're continuing to try to explore. Um, the competition was called um, the Traveling Box Containers. I mean, no, this is, this is called the, the, the competition was uh, called the Density Competition, um, which was put together by the BSA. And I'll talk about that um, in a moment. Um, and, and our project was called Gloucester Green, um, and the location was Gloucester, Massachusetts, where we explored opportunities to um, use containers to create 351 dwelling units, 170,000 square feet of commercial uses, 30,000 square feet of community facilities. The, um, the organizers with, were the Boston Society of Architects um, with the national um, component of the Regional and Urban Design Committee for the AIA. Um, I led the team um, with a, um, participation by my partner, Bruce Fowl, and another partner, Dan Kaplan, and our planning studio, John Lochran, Bijou Shara Talutu, and um, Nino Hewitt. And we brought some specialty advisors into this process because we want to look at um, sustainability issues. We brought a gentleman named Bill Reed, um, economics, um, Richard Gottschneider of RKG up in um, New England. And we also brought in um, Barry Hirsch, who's the associate director of the S Stephen Newman Real Estate Institute, um, connected to Baruch College in New York. Um, in 2003, FX FA was named by the Boston Society of Architects as one of six winners in an international density competition, the purpose of which was to highlight new ideas for making cities and suburbs better places to live. Um, the competition challenged entrants to design communities that balanced density and livability at one of three sites in Greater Boston. The winning um, submissions received an award, a cash prize, and were featured at Density, Myth, and Reality, a national conference on density and related issues held in Boston in September of that year. Um, at the time, I was vice president for public outreach for the AIA New York chapter. Um, I was originally invited to the conference to be part of a panel discussion on the rebuilding of Lower Manhattan in New York following the destruction of the World Trade Center. Um, I had previously led a pro bono group of design and planning professionals that came together after 9-11 to define the principles for rebuilding Lower Manhattan. The Lower Manhattan Development Corporation later adopted our principles, and the conference highlighted innovative planning ideas that were being ex explored across the nation, and there was much interest in the rebuilding of Lower Manhattan. Um, when we received the proceedings for the conference, we also received a design brief about the competition, and I became intrigued by the thought of entering it. As planners and architects working with public authorities and developers, we're often stymied in our ability to be truly innovative by the multiple constraints imposed by our clients. Um, competitions provide an outlet to explore new ideas. Um, cons consequently, we, reviewed, we viewed the density competition as an occasion for our planning and urban design studio to get its creative juices flowing. Additionally, because FX Files had substantial experience with smart growth projects, transit-oriented -orient deve development, and sustainability, the competition seemed like a natural fit for our expertise. Um, at the outset, we thought about the meaning of maximizing density. Real we realized that for us, maximizing density did not mean overburdening a site and doing what I call stuffing 10 pounds of buildings on a five pound site. Instead, it was about developing a concept that respects the environmental, economic, and social carrying capacity of the site. 
we came to the realization that weaving all three was critical to the success of a community. A site can be packed solely with housing, but if environmental systems are overburdened and employment and community services are not available, um, the project will fail. For the competition, we decided to include a group of specialty advisors on our team. I just mentioned Bill Reed, um, Dick Gottschneider, and Barry Hirsch, who helped us address issues of sustainability, economic viability, and community revitalization. Um, prior to the competition, um, Barry Hirsch from the Newman Institute had shared a draft of a paper that he had written that explored the use of shipping containers for housing. Barry noted that looking at the large stacks of containers um, is vaguely reminiscent of Moshe Safdie's concrete boxes used in his famous habitat project in, in Montreal. Those concrete boxes, which with all their accoutrements, um, turned out to be more expensive than conventional construction, partly because the boxes needed the structural integri integrity to be individually moved and stacked in, a di in, a, in different ways. Barry posed the question, does the steel container, inexpensive and designed to be stacked, offer a design opportunity for the third world, cities, or anywhere? Although Barry's paper asked more questions than it answered, working on the East Coast adjacent to the New York Harbor and the Atlantic Ocean, the idea of incorporating containers as building blocks for housing seemed very intriguing to us. As a starting point for the competition, we, we decided to research the subject more fully and explore its adaptability for the density competition. Um, we began by searching articles and publications as reported in the Albany Times Union on April 22, 2003. They stand like empty Everests of trade, mountains of shipping containers stacked seven or eight high, over hundreds of acres of, of industrial land around the East Coast's busiest ports. Because of the deficit, the port takes in and unloads more containers than it can fill up and ship out. Moreover, since it is cheaper for freight companies to buy new containers overseas than to ship empty ones back from the United States to be fully ro reloaded. This was definitely true four years ago with the price of steel rising. It's, it's changed somewhat. The result is the stockpiling that has literally altered the local landscape. Indicative of the nation's trade deficit, the Newark Elizabeth complex uh, up, unloaded in 2003 1.6 million full containers in the first 11 months and only shipped out 688,000, which is a deficit of nearly a million containers. Um, nevertheless, as we investigated further, we found that the containers by themselves were not that suitable for housing. Generally eight feet wide by nine and one half um, feet high, and, and that varies depending upon the manufacturer, and spans of 20, 25, and 40 feet in length. The width is considerably too ha narrow for what's considered habitable space in residential development. Um, additionally, they lack fireproofing and insulation, so once you start including those elements, it, it makes it even narrower. Despite these constraints, we discovered that there were a number of architects in the United States who were exploring their reuse within single-family homes and temporary housing. Um, Low Tech, which was mentioned yesterday, and, and, and Jennifer Siegel um, are obviously two firms that, that um, have been doing it with single-family housing. And of course, there's also been um, many uses within art installations, um, including um, on the on the left, um, Shaburo Ban's um, use of containers as a wall for an art installation on, in a New York port a couple of years ago. Um, however, in 2003, we did not find any applications for multiple family housing. What we did determine, however, is that because they are constructed, constructed with clear span steel, and by the way, when I put this in the PowerPoint, I didn't know Mark Levison was going to be here, so I, I hope he sees this as a compliment. Um, um, what we did not, what we determined, however, is that because they're constructed with clear span steel box um, frames, sheathing um, could be removed without compromising the structural integrity. Therefore, by, and that's, I should emphasize that th that that's not always the case. Well, um, the, the fact is that what we, even today, we saw different containers on the lot where some of them had a steel box frame and some of them had the sheathing going all the way up as a structural component. So one has to be careful with what kind of container one is using. 
Therefore, um, in, with the right container, one could cluster the containers, remove the intermediate sheathing, and unit widths can be created that are 16 feet or 24 feet, which are much more appropriate for housing. Additionally, since they're built to be stacked 10 to 12 units high, um, fully loaded, um, they have structural advantages. We've also discovered that to bring light and air into units, the sheathing um, could be removed from the end panels. For the BSA density competition, because of our interest in utilizing the container as a building block for the project, we selected a site near water and on the, ra and on the rail line. The Fox and um, the FX file team, we used to be called Fox and File, um, chose an 18.6 acres of sparsely developed land adjacent to the rail station near the center of Gloucester on the north shore of Massachusetts. We looked at the relationship of the site to the immediate context. We examined the adjacency to transit surrounding retail, um, uses open space and woodlands. Um, and we examined site opportunities, um, commuter rail service as a gateway to the city, um, a street called Washington Street, which is the major connector, um, the proximity of the site to the Civic Center, and, and looking at opportunities to connect the, um, the, the railroad station site to the rest of the community. We looked at the relationship to the harbor, the opportunity to improve the experience of visitors entering the city, and the opportunities to expand the existing retail uses near the railroad station. We also reviewed site constraints. Um, it was along a, com a commuter line with um, 13 Boston-bound trains stopping daily, and the project site was relatively isolated from the historic retail district in the Inner Harbor um, because of the poor street network that existed in the community. Um, calling our design Gloucester Green, Renew, Recycle, Rejoice, FX File proposed the reuse of shipping containers, which would be creatively recycled as low-cost build, building elements for 351 new live-work housing units. Um, we saw that the recycling of the containers had an environmental benefit. Um, additionally, for the competition project, um, FX file envisions stacked loft duplexes. Um, excuse me. Um, that contain four eight foot wide by nine and a half foot high um, by 20 foot long containers to create a modular unit width of 16 feet and up to 1,280 um, square feet. I'm sorry, they were f they were um, 40 foot long containers to create um, a. a tw 1,280 square foot size unit. As previously described, we removed the intermediate sheathing to create unit widths that were appropriate for housing. On the exterior, the sheathing would also be removed from the end panels so that a modular window wall would be inserted within the frame. Um, from an urban design perspective, um, we saw this as an opportunity to renew and rejuvenate this part of Gloucester. Um, borrowing from John Wood's Bath Crescent with, um, as a professor of mine at Cornell once said, with its Queen Anne front and its Jane Jacobs back, the plan responded to the natural organization of the site. Um, however, in this case, we, we, we call this um, Bath Inside Out, where the curved facade of the at Atelier housing forms an arc that reinforces an existing, the existing and operating rail line and forms a backdrop to the city um, instead of forming a backdrop to the space. Um, we also proposed um, that the south-facing spine of the arc would be sheathed with a, a living briselet of bamboo stalks and plantings that would provide natural shading and provide, and provide a, a green backdrop to the city. We discovered there was actually a bamboo farm in Rockport immediately adjacent to the site, and we wanted to explore the opportunity to use the bamboo as a part of the aesthetic vision of the housing. Um, at the lower level, we envisioned um, live-work lofts, artist lofts that, that could include galleries and shop houses. At the western end of the site, the parcel um, would be reconfigured to create a gateway green as a town square to mark the entry into the downtown from Washington Street 
and to establish a focus for a farmer's market and commercial activities. The plan included a food co cooperative and retail uses on the ground floor, and upper fl um, floors were designed to accommodate businesses that outgrow the atelier shop houses. A visitor center and a hotel was also planned for the green. Um, to the southwest, a community center, um, theater, um, and a, um, a sort of community space um, would link to nearby public buildings. And we envisioned a series of pedestrian mews that would trans, trans, um, traverse between the low-rise townhouses and reinforce pedestrian connections to the historic center of town, all using the same um, approach to, to the to, um, the modular housing. Um, from a planning standpoint, retail and commercial uses activated the lower levels and the gateway green um, um, with residential uses above. Um, the plan also incorporated an environmental learning center, which would make use of fabricated um, wetlands, restored wetlands, and urban agriculture as a, li as a living laboratory. We saw the project as sustainable from an environmental, social, and economic perspective. And I won't get into the detail of that right now. But we incorporated natural systems and, 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 and wove the natural environment into the project, specifically by preserving the um, open space and natural area and using the, the, um, um, the re reuse, redeveloping on the more brownfields part of the site. Um, we also explored opportunities for urban gardens and agriculture. And um, we incorporated porous paving and zip cars to minimize the ne negative impacts of cars and parking. Although I, I, I think learning from UC Santa Barbara, we probably should have provided more opportunities for bicycles. Um, from, um, we also incorporated an environmental learning center into the project. From a social perspective, we wanted the site to be a fun place to live and work. So we reorganized the plan to maximize residential facilities and open space. And that's um, how we made use of the existing um, woodlands that existed on the site. And I'll just show you a few views. These were um, sketches that we created as part of the competition package, uh, a sketch of the atelier housing and, uh, and the gateway green, um, the community element, which was not the only element that was not made from containers as a, as a, as a um, public auditorium that reinforced the, the, the um, community, the, the, the sort of civic district of the community, and then the townhouse muse is on the right. Um, from an implementation point of view, we even thought about phasing. We thought about maybe using the idea of, of rehabilitating containers on the site as part of an incubator business for the community as well. And in August of 2003, we, 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 we received word that the Gloucester Green Project was selected as one of the competition winners, and the project was going to be featured in an exhibition and conference. Subsequently, it also won an award at the Green Build Conference in Seattle of that year. Um, the following spring, Urban Land Magazine published an article about um, Gloucester Green entitled Container Housing. The author, William Mock, noted that while the con cargo containers are inexpensively built in low-wage exporting countries such as China for under $2,500, their heavy construction and large v volume make them expensive to return. As a result, a standard 320 square foot shipping container may be had for as little as $600 or less than $2 per square foot, far less than the, ex than the least expensive stick framing. Now, you have to recognize that this was in 2003 and 4, and the truth of the matter is, since then, as we heard from Jorgen earlier, um, steel prices have skyrocketed, and it's not as economically um, um, it, it's not as easy to get containers today. Um, 
Although this project was published in numerous publications and received considerable development interest, because it was an ideas competition, the concept was never realized. Nevertheless, following the Katrina disaster engineering news record, um, and that's the sh scene on the right, referenced the project in a, a 10 5 editorial, emergency housing can be tough as steel and suggested that this country should be advocating similar out-of-the-box thinking with regard to affordable housing and emergency housing. In a response letter that was published two weeks later, we noted that despite considerable initial interest in the concept from developers, we found that these projects were difficult to, to move forward because of the time associated with implementing new ideas in housing in the United States, in the United States especially with regard to educating building officials, unions, and contractors. We also found that in many communities, there are negative connotations associated with the reuse of shipping containers for housing, and it did not help that prisoners in Afghanistan and Iraq were housed in them during the war. Um, we've come to realize that to succeed as affordable or emergency housing in this country, this concept first has to gain acceptance as upscale market rate housing or artist housing to withstand the negative implications. Um, despite um, the concerns in the United States, there is some in innovative development beginning to occur overseas. Um, I know that um, the people from Container City were going to be on this panel. They've done something with residential development. At the time, there was no um, um, multifamily housing applications that actually use containers for um, multiple family dwellings. But the website um, www.fabprefab.com identifies today over 50 projects that have been designed and planned that utilize shipping containers as building blocks for housing, hotels, and commercial uses. Many of these projects have been built or are, are currently in construction. The site notes that there is growing interest in the use of shipping containers as the basis for habitable structures. These icons of globalization are relatively inexpensive, structurally sound, um, and, abundant, and are in abundant supply. Although in raw form, containers are dark, windowless boxes, which might place them at odds with some of the tenets of modernist design. Actually, it puts them right in sync with the tenets of modernist design. They can be highly um, customizable modular elements of a larger structure. Some of the sites also note that the container projects do not even have to look like containers. It is a relatively simple matter to completely clad buildings externally in a huge variety of materials. However, as for FX file, we love the look of the shipping container cities and would not like to disguise them. Like an Italian or Greek hill tile, they rise up along the shore in playful and colorful patterns. And so we're going to continue to explore opportunities to incorporate and recycle the container as building blocks for future civilizations. Thank you. See, um, well, I just want to first say thanks to uh, Nelson and Dick and Kim for having us out here. Um, I think I can speak for Kara and say that uh, we're both thrilled to uh, have this opportunity to sort of show some of the work we've been doing over the past uh, couple of years um, with our program. Um, also, it's I find it a little odd. Uh, about two months ago, if you'd have asked me, um, or if you'd have told me that I'd be in the same room with uh, two people from the University of Georgia, I would think that it was probably have something to do with our football game that, uh, that we'll be having tomorrow. Um, and it would be in Athens and not uh, here in Santa Barbara, but I guess this uh, just goes to show that it's uh, another example of uh, this box making our globe a little smaller. All right, um, so I'll start, um, I'll start and tell you sort of a little bit about our program um, and the work we've been doing with shipping containers. Um, and then I'll pass it on to Kara, and she'll tell you sort of where we're going to go um, from here. And uh, here you go on our slide. Um, 
just kind of shows an idea of what we do with the Design Build Masters program at Auburn. It's um, well, we mainly our main goal is to assist the citizens in need throughout Alabama. Uh, we do that through um, this concept of context-based learning uh, for our graduate students. Basically, really get them in there hands-on. Um, they make all the decisions with their projects. Uh, that's really why we brought Kara here too, so and let, and let her talk about where we're going to go from here. So, um, sort of the the genesis of our uh, work with containers was this project called the Auburn Piro, uh, and that's a funny looking word um, that you see there at the top, and it's a uh, it's actually a Cajun word, and it. Um, a piro is a flat bottom boat sometimes dug out of a hollow tree trunk um, and it's used in the bayous of uh, Louisiana and, and southern Mississippi and things to get into places where uh, conventional boats can't get um, so we thought it was a pretty um, adapt uh, name to call our project uh, which deals with emergency housing following the wake of Hurricane Katrina um, of course here's just a slide of sort of how big Hurricane Katrina is, of course, um, Louisiana and New Orleans, which took the brunt of it, um, certainly got a lot of the exposure, but as you can see from this slide, uh, not just Louisiana was affected, but also Mississippi and Alabama. Um, here's, uh, we took a trip down to the Gulf. Uh, this is probably about two weeks after Hurricane Katrina hit, and we still couldn't even get into Louisiana, so as far as we got was Gulfport, Mississippi. And this is one of the homes that was sitting right on the bay in Gulfport, um, as you can see, uh, completely uh, destroyed. And even some of the um, apartment housing, you know, just completely wiped out. Um, this is sort of the state of the area down there, and it's sort of telling this uh, sign on the front of this little uh, convenience store that says, uh, looters will be shot. Um, so it gives you kind of an idea of what, what, what it was like down there. Um, being in Alabama and having some of Alabama's residents affected by this and also um, uh, this, this catastrophe or disaster was uh, certainly on the minds of, of our region, um, not only because, like I said, it, it affected our citizens in Alabama, but also uh, the citizens of the southeast and the Gulf Coast. Um, we were really looking at a way that we could help um, sort of, you know, in a, our, our, me as a student at the time and, I, and, um, and, and my fellow students wanted an idea, uh, we had an idea of how we could help um, because uh, we knew it was such a, an important cause and such a, a terrible problem. Um, basically, of course, what we're dealing with is dislocated people, uh, people who've been uprooted from their homes and their neighborhoods, and uh, it was our assumption, or uh, not assumption, but our, um, our theory that, that the sooner we could get them back uh, on their land, in their neighborhoods, with uh, their sort of support groups, uh, the better it would be for them. So we have this idea of dislocation. Uh, what we can provide and what is needed is a warm, dry room. Um, and, and we'll get into how we kind of approach that um, uh, in this idea of opportunity. We looked at this uh, shipping containers as a, certainly an opportunity where we could quickly and low, uh, with low cost provide housing uh, for these people. Um, so when we have this proposal and we'll go into the process and we'll even towards the end I'll talk about a little bit about the unit cost. Um, it's funny that uh, Mark put in the slide of uh, the Habitat Project in Montreal because um, shortly after we visited Gulfport, we had a planned trip to Montreal and we're standing sort of on the top of this uh, housing complex in Montreal and looking across the river at the port with uh, a bunch of numerous shipping containers stacked up. So we kind of felt like we were on the right track there when we saw that. Um, of course, the shipping container, we all know what it looks like. Um, started out really working in model form. Um, sort of some long nights with exacto knives and chipboard. Then we got to work with our full-scale model, uh, obviously cutting some of the metal apart, things like that, um, grinding pieces off. This is just some pictures I'll go through of sort of the construction process that we went through, sort of prefabbing walls that could go inside, certainly uh, painting it with an elastomeric paint, which um, helps out with our heat gain and things like that, certainly something that we have to think of in that region. Um, 
this paint blocks out 95% of the UV rays, which really cut down on the heat gain. Uh, the idea, you know, we're, this, we're new to containers, so we have to think about how uh, it's best for us to move them around. Um, it was easiest for us on campus at Auburn to use cranes. Uh, we'll sh show you some other ideas that uh, make it a little simpler. Um, loading them onto flatbed trucks that aren't even designed to hold them, but uh, you can see that this structural integrity stays intact, even with a hole cut in the side. Um, we got the opportunity to put the, our container and work on it and build it uh, right there on the center of campus. Um, obviously, when Katrina hit, it was sort of right in this time of the football season. And, and as our friends from Georgia know, and anybody from the southeast, football is sort of the way it goes down there. Um, so it gave us a, a good opportunity to get a lot of exposure. Um, and this is a slide, obviously, that shows the students and really uh, the work that we do really wouldn't be done without, number one, um, our uh, professors and things, I was a student again at this time, our professors given us the, uh, having trust in us to um, take on this project and, and, and construct it ourselves, but also um, the students with their uh, drive and things like that to be able to uh, implement it. Um, of course, again, college football game day, lots of exposure. This day we probably had um, 10 to 20,000 people walk through our container. Um, so it really drummed up a lot of support for our cause and uh, raised a little bit of money also in the process. Um, we got a chance to show it to the governor, that's uh, Bob Riley there and our state representative. After we um, went through a couple football games that way, we got to set it up in a little bit of a community setting there on the campus. It's a little um, off to the side near some of the married housing on campus, um, but we really needed a chance to set it up in sort of this community um, layout and get an idea of how it can work. Um, and you'll see some very brightly colored ones. Uh, we joke because the student that picked out the colors was colorblind, but he didn't tell us that until after he picked out the colors. Um, so this, again, we'll just kind of go through some of these. I know we have a time constraints here. Um, finally, the day came that we got to implement one of our uh, prototypes and send it to Gulfport for a very needing uh, lady who didn't, of course, like most of the residents there, didn't have any flood insurance. Um, her roof was ripped off of her house, so she really needed a place to stay. Um, so we, we got to load it up on the truck. This is one of the trucks that you back up to it, and it has a winch, and it just pulls it straight up the side, so there's no need for a crane sort of uh, us standing there as it, as it rolled out, <laughs> certainly driving down the road. We were pretty excited about this. Um, definitely a big day. Uh, the whole neighborhood came out and people were cheering and everything. It was neat. Um, of course, you see the brightly orange and blue colored. And put it on football. Uh, in the middle of campus during football, we got a paint in orange and blue. It really helped us uh, generate some money, too. Um, but here you go. You can see us dropping it off in her yard. Um, so, big day. We got to, uh, we had to do a little bit of on-site work, uh, some of that being uh, adding a canopy over the door. Um, obviously, when she's uh, coming in, bringing in her groceries and it's raining, she needs someplace dry where she can get her keys out. So, uh, just a real minimal sort of um, awning structure that goes over it that can be packed inside the container as it's shipped, and in fact it was. Um, and that's her, that's Mrs. Barbara Myers. Uh, Certainly very happy to be standing there. Um, if you notice in the window, of course, you see the big Auburn sticker, but uh, I think the thing that we're more proud of is the uh, building permit that's, that's placed in the window right above the, right above the picture. It's funny, uh, when we talk about the building permit, and uh, Mark touched on it a little bit, we constructed uh, this unit for her probably um, in about with, and we're talking about four students working on it uh, in terms of construction, we probably spent um, two weeks worth of construction time on it, um, and it took us um, almost two months to get it passed through the city council so that she could use it. Um, so those are the kind of barriers that Mark touched on that we're going to have to, you know, work our way through to make this a viable option. Um, here you can see some of the interiors, um, just simple uh, wood frame uh, interiors on the inside with uh, jipboard and polystyrene insulation. Just 
He goes, she's, that's her on the first day that she moved in. We were about to, we handed her the keys over and we we're about to leave. Um, so she was about to spend her first night uh, back on her land. She hadn't been able to use her house. All right, so I'll go through sort of the, some of the prototypes that we started out with. And you can see at the bottom, there's a little bit of, there, we've got a number for unit cost there. Um, this one uh, sort of container that we started with first was really low end in terms of the interior finishes. We're really looking at this uh, very low cost. You see that total cost of $2,500. Um, that doesn't have anything on the walls. Uh, it's really just what we spent on the wood and the windows and the doors that we put in it. Um, and again, these costs don't show the cost for the container because the container prices fluctuate more than even conventional building materials. And it also doesn't show the labor cost because it was done, the labor is provided by uh, our students. Here's another one with uh, a little bit higher end finishes, a different design. Uh, we call this one the shotgun, uh, putting the doors on the two ends, the, uh, certainly the cargo end with the cargo doors and then the opposite end. It increases airflow. Uh, it really helps out with the, uh, regulating the inside temperature and things like that. And then finally, the last of the prototypes that we did that year uh, was the one that ended up down in Gulfport. And as you can see, we spent about uh, $5,400 on the materials that went inside of it. One thing you will notice in the plan of this uh, unit is that there is no bathroom or kitchen. And her house, the roof was torn off over her um, living room and uh, in her bedroom, so she couldn't sleep in it. However, she still had use of her bathroom and her kitchen. So that's why it was, she was sort of the right client for us at the time. So that's sort of the wrap up of the p -Row. Um From there, what we wanted to do was look at this idea of using um, the, the container or the p -Row unit as a building block for a larger size house. And we had a client in uh, East Alabama AIDS Outreach who um, needed a facility where they could house women uh, who are affected with HIV or AIDS that also have children. Um, so we came up with a solution for them. It's about a um, 2,100 square foot home. Uh, it can house two, uh, two women and up to four children. And that, that plan's a little hard to read, but um, sort of the goals that we wanted to do, of course, was to continue this use of this, the containers as a structural element. And they, in, a, in, our, in this house, they did become the complete, uh, they held all the structure of the house the floor and the roof. Um, also, uh, continue the study of how the containers uh, could certainly house individuals. Um, you know, working with this module of eight feet, like Mark talked about, it's a very narrow space. So this is another way that we could study that. Um, incorporate bathrooms. Certainly the, the one that we sent to Gulfport, of course, didn't have the bathroom. Um, also refine the methods to incorporate openings. Uh, that's some of the things that, that we've always kind of struggled with. Um, and also this idea of taking a Piro unit, setting in place, and being able to build a home around it. So you can see, um, sort of this is a, another diagram of the plan. And you can see the two containers on either side, each one having its own bathroom sort of stuck on the side of the container. Um, if you'll just kind of keep that in mind, we'll, we'll show you another slide here in a little bit that looks very similar to that, but basically living space and kitchen and some storage uh, there in between the two containers. Um, sort of this idea of each family having one side and then they meet together in the center. Uh, just a slide of it going up. You can see the containers on the side, definitely holding up all the trusses that are holding up the roof. I'll go through these really fast because these are just sort of a, sort of you can see how it went, how it just kind of grew out of the ground there. Um, I know we're short on time here, so we'll get through it. All right, so 17 weeks, um, four students, 17 weeks to build uh, this house. It did go a little bit longer than 17 weeks, um, doing a, finishing up a little bit of the interiors and things. Uh, but you can get an idea when you're talking about being able to take care of all the structure for a house with just two containers, you can really go uh, pretty fast. Some of the numbers on that, uh, like I said, it was 2,100 square feet. We built this house for just over fifty thousand dollars. If you um, if you do the math on that, you, you come up to about thirty dollars a square foot. Um, again, that's just the material cost. 
Um, in the landscape of Alabama, it's reasonable to assume that you can double that if you want to look at your labor costs. So we're looking at $60 a square foot, which um, is far below sort of the standard in Alabama. It's about $140 a square foot for a custom built home. Probably more than that now. Moving on a little bit further, um, last year we got together with a local architect and a contractor and we were able to uh, design a Salvation Army Family Store. Basically it's a thrift store where the Salvation Army can sell uh, goods that they have donated to them. Uh, here's a rendering of it. This project is currently under construction so I'll show you some construction photographs of it. Um, but uh, I, I will, unfortunately I don't have any uh, finished pictures to show you today. Um, but again, it's this idea, we had a long, narrow site. So um, this idea, not unlike the art museum in, uh, or the art installation in New York, stacking uh, 10 shipping containers uh, down two long walls. And uh, we'll, you'll see we'll fill it in and uh, fill in the, the blank spots there. Um, here's just the roof going on and some of the exterior sheathing. Where you uh, see the blank spots will have a translucent um, uh, curtain wall type material, um, not unlike the roof and the gallery that we were in last night when we watched the film. If any of you looked up and looked at the ceiling in there, it's this translucent material. In fact, I think it's the same material. Um, that's sort of an interior of the, uh, a shot of the interior construction going on. Uh, we're really excited about this building. Uh, again, the same kind of problems we, we faced with the city council. We just had to really sit down with them and show them that this is a viable method and it probably took a little bit longer to get it permitted uh, than your typical uh, construction style. But um, I think it was worth it. We got it uh, permitted and as you can see, it's underway. So now I'll pass it over to Kara. So after all this initial research, uh, the next step was, you know, what do we need to do to move these projects forward to make them more livable for people in them and to make it more accepted by the community? So uh, we need to design and build more prototypes so we can test out, you know, what is it like to live in this for an extended period? Uh, what are the psychological and physical effects of that? Um, we wanted to explore adaptability, that is to uh, various regions and sites, as well as different people's needs, user needs, site conditions, climate and regional, and then uh, adapting it to different ways of transport as well. And we also wanted to work out this to be a low cost method so that could be um, a type of affordable housing. We also wanted to explore issues of safety, uh, sp specifically for sending this into regions where hurricanes are um, a risk. You, want, uh, you don't want this box to go tumbling in the next storm. And we, um, one of our other things that we're really trying to explore is to um, find some kind of way that we can produce these on a larger scale so that we can help more people. So user needs. Um, we are exploring different family types and different um, physical uh, limitations and exploring that through different models. So this is the one that you saw in Gulfport. It's more for um, a couple, maybe with one small child, so that would be a small family unit. Uh, we're also exploring it as a relief worker housing after Hurricane Cr Katrina, that was one of the major problems is so many people were like rushing down there to help that they were putting an even larger strain on the system as far as where are people going to stay. So we thought, um, set up in sort of a bunk type unit. Uh, with the layout here, we have nine people with just regular beds, or if you make those bunk beds, you can get 18 people in one unit. We're considering with this one having a separate unit that would be a shower and bathing uh, communal facility as well as uh, communal dining facilities. This is where we're starting to work out having a bathroom and a kitchen. Uh, I don't think this one had a shower in it. This one did not have a shower. Uh, but uh, you're starting to see how that's starting to work out. You're still only getting a couple and maybe a child or two into that. Here is 
close to what you saw at the um, women's aides house with the bathroom, which is handicap accessible. And um, here you're still getting just a couple. Now we're starting to extend it out to a larger family. In the South, it's not unusual to have grandparents and multi-generations living together. So here you could have um, several couples, many more children, and you're also getting the bath and kitchen. This we were exploring, what we call the dog trot, we were exploring um, maybe two single women with children, um, being able to get two different, two separate spaces into one 40-foot container. Then this is what you saw with the AIDS house where we're exploring how to use that initial container as the basis for permanent housing. So the site conditions that we're tr trying to work out. Uh, this is actually a site on campus where we're building some of these prototypes now. Um, we're going to have one container that's on grid and it's going to be handicap accessible. That will be for sites where there is existing utilities and uh, you can hook up to those. We're also exploring off-grid uh, container which would not be hooked up to the city utilities. That's really important in the case of um, emergencies because a lot of times the utilities are knocked out and even if they are there you don't always have the a necessary number of plumbers and electricians to do the hookups. So you need to be able to have a self-contained unit that, um, that can be uh, work on its own without connecting to any city utilities. So you can do that through generators, solar cells. Uh, we want to talk about different cl climate and regions. One thing that certain federal management agencies do is send the exact same unit out no matter where in the United States. We want to take into consideration the different cultural and climatic regions. And then different transport and delivery methods. So this is the container that I'm actually working on now. This is the off-the-grid green container. Uh, we have the bathroom at the end with the outdoor shower. Hopefully we'll have some kind of water catchment system where we can use that. Uh, a little bed nook with a kitchenette, a pop-out where we'll have the dining room and then sort of a little living space on the end. Um, this opening's already cut in it. There'll be some wood around the edge for the outdoor shower. And then right here in the middle, what you're seeing is the pop-out which would be stored inside the container for shipping and then would be able to be pushed out at the very end. So in summary, we'll be using these for emergency shelter and relief housing. And then, um, yeah, we've already talked about all this. Thank you very much. Well, um, there's a reason why artists aren't architects. Um, the units that you saw that were 300 square feet, designed and built by artists, took over a year, okay, not three weeks. And um, of course, you know, we go back to a kind of utopian uh, perspective and the idea of the imagination and also the way in which artists, I think, um, do a good job of commenting on cultural conditions and, and the container becomes as um, a Andrew earlier, uh, from a ge geographer's perspective, they become social objects. And if I could, you know, I'm not, we're not geographers, but um, I've changed the name of our area from sculpture to spatial studies because I felt as though the object this is, is a social and contextual entity. It's not isolated. Um, minimalists or modernists might differ uh, with me, but um, and then I also liked what Andrew said about, you know, geography as a dialectic between the landscape and social being. And if I were to plug in his, uh, John Hart's words, uh, to geoscales, um, containers are subjective artistic devices shaped to fit the hand of the individual user, um, social products or social um, objects. So, um, oh.
math user. <laughs> So open up the box. Um, let's see. Of course, yesterday we were kind of moving full circle back from Jennifer Siegel, the one woman in the sea of containers uh, yesterday uh, on the discussions of containers. And um, you know, as an architect, and as you saw at the end of her lecture, her imaginative kind of musings of the future. Um, I wanted to bring up a really interesting intersection between the arts, culture, and Kaohsiung International Container Arts Festival is ongoing right now. And for those of you in the container discourse, know that um, Kaohsiung is, I think, the fifth largest port uh, city uh, in Taipei, or in, in the world. And um, what's interesting is they do this festival as a, a kind of strategy to bring identity and um, sort of uh, cultural, uh, cultural uh, engagement as a city, um, a steel manufacturing and steel, uh, container manufacturing city. Um, and if you read this, um, the, the curator statement, corresponding to the theme of home and also to Kaohsiung's goal of becoming a city of happiness, the festival will take place in now Waipi, the sweet and happy home of Kaohsiung Museum of Fine Arts. Um, but what was so interesting, and I couldn't show you because I guess we're being televised, I can't show the imagery, but you can go to the website. They invited artists from all over the world, so it was sort of a biennial, um, an international biennial. But what was so interesting is that the artists start to uncover some of those uh, dystopian or, you know, unseen parts of uh, containerization. Uh, this German artist, um, you know, uh, uh, actually I wanted to point out the Edouard Koch. Um, no, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm looking at the Yugoslavian artist or the uh, Chinese artist, Transmigration, a two-level red container that leads the viewer through a claustrophobic space which opens onto a floor projection. The projection shows cardboard boxes that slowly open, revealing human inhabitants, the sound of babies, and evokes the cycle of death. And that brings up that question that and one of my art students asked yesterday about what about drug trafficking and human trafficking? The artist tends to kind of dig more deeply into the sort of underbelly of a lot of um, these things. So it's not always utopian. So I want to just recap how, how this all came about very quickly because you already saw the actual um, impractical unit that we designed uh, 300 square feet out of two 20 foot containers. Um, Dick Hebdige and I team taught a class called Open Container. Uh, in the spring of 06, and it was a interdisciplinary course. And the idea was uh, basically it came about because Jorgen Stahl offered us two huge shipping containers and a new unit to really go at it. And I think he had in mind something a lot more practical. Um, as an artist, my role tended to be more of the facilitate, fil facilitator, and Dick, I would say, was the content provider. But I got to give credit to Robert. Um, Weschler, who was a graduate of our program, who really had a, 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 a strong um, design sense, and but none of us are architects, so that's the interesting thing about this. The other thing to keep in mind is the abundance, empty and nowhere to go, um, is that if you think of the container in multiples, you don't think of them as single units, the design possibilities open up. Now, I. Being in a visual arts department, I always constantly have to justify these social objects within an con art historical context. And this is the work of Donald Judd and um, the sort of multiple, that sort of um, disengaged, empty box. Um, and uh, very, but, but yet the container is so loaded, uh, contextually, situationally loaded, whereas, you know, the minimalist kind of, you know, uh, removing or, or dislocating itself from a, a broader cultural context. And so our students did exercises with that standard 8 by 8 by 20 foot unit, playing with it in every which way. Uh, this was sort of a cluster housing. And these are all art students, and none of them had any background in, in design but, um, or architecture. And so what you see is a kind of artist, uh, you know, minimalist, modernist exercise of that unit and what that unit aesthetically had the capacity to do. And here we have Jorgen, who actually came to our crits and offered his insight on all the different designs of the class. Each student had to propose a design, and then collectively we had to commit to one 
design, which I think was, for an artist, a very uh, difficult process of collaboration and giving up one's individual sort of aesthetic uh, desires for the sake of the whole. It's a very different operation. So the unit that we did decide to create, of course, has no 90 degree angles, is very impractical to build. Um, and yet it created this wonderful modularity and flexibility uh, by, by taking the corners off of two containers and it, you know, mirror inverting them, you actually get this amazing uh, kind of Fibonacci perfect uh, um, capacity to reconfigure it in, in many, many ways. And of course, if you keep going with that, one of our students sort of designed uh, this kind of panoptican prison. It looks like it could be a prison complex, but that's that same unit that you saw out there multiplied and stacked in this kind of interesting circular way. And she also um, visualized, you know, a, a kind of uh, spatial arrangement that she, and, and again, we're not designing these for, you know, uh, suburban residential. These are with the idea of student housing. And if you know our situation here uh, in uh, Santa Barbara, our student uh, town, Isla Vista, is considered one of the densest cities west of the Mississippi. Um, rooms go for $1,000. That means sometimes students are four to a room. So density in small spaces are not something that preoccupies the student. They'd be thrilled to live in that unit down in the atrium. Uh, so Jorgen, again, we actually had to get ourselves out of the academic sit and listen to somebody lecture like me and actively engage in the material world. And uh, I think, you know, I could, there are many ways you could teach, uh, you know, metalworking, uh, you know, having them do exercises, but this was one of the best uh, hands-on exercise uh, objects that you could imagine. Um, cutting into it, framing it in, welding in the, the two by two steel. And then there you see from above what our container, one, one of our unit containers actually is. Of course, uh, we are artists, and uh, as we were closing the two units together and we were gonna bolt them together, there was this slot left. And if anyone knows uh, Gordon Mata Clark, you know, he did the Split House, a wonderful uh, artist, where he actually took uh, or buildings that were condemned and would alter them in amazing ways um, in the city of New York, and this was called Split House, and it was, a, it was a sculpture, it was a piece. And so we decided in the middle of the night that we were not gonna close that gap, and we were going to frame it in, and, and what, what that brought on was a whole set of problems of, uh, you know, skylighting, and you know, in other words, it was, a, it was to maintain that, that eight inches was, probably took us about three months or four months uh, of time. I, I have to give credit to the array, uh, you know, of the army of people that came in. None of us were architects. Uh, David Jurist, uh, who is actually I'm team teaching a class with right now, is also a contractor and a sculptor, and he helped us uh, with the very difficult part of uh, pragmatics. That, that is some part that I lost all the students. They all disappeared when we had to roof and insulate and uh, glaze. And uh, David uh, actually um, helped us with both the roofing and the insulation. Um, so here you have Armada Clark happily. Um, and I want to um, credit, I have some of the students sitting here in the class. This is Brooke uh, Devaney, actually hands-on learning the plasma cutter and welder because she came up with this wild idea that she wanted to fill a whole surface with uh, beautiful windows, much in the spirit of Ronchamp, Le Cabozier, this idea of light passing through. And that was uh, basically setting herself up for about eight months of hard labor and, and problem solving. So it, one thing, it was one thing to cut it out, it was another thing to frame it in, and then it was another thing to figure out how to actually seal it off to the elements. So by the time we finished uh, in the spring, we had this very kind of Mata Clark sculptural object um, that had this very uh, interesting mirroring effect, and we were completely happy with it. But in order to have some credibility in the world, you have to somehow prove that it could be habitable on some level. And so that, is why, you know, that whole process of artists moving from something imaginary to something very real and hands-on was, was a challenging uh, uh, element for all of us. And so what you have is the finished container. And what was really interesting for me is how do you uh, enable the individual artist to have a hand in something collective, like 
this collective project. And we had one student, um, Sergio Sosedo, who actually was a print, print artist. And these are vinyl cutouts that you see on the facade of the container that um, in a way he was a graffiti artist from LA and this was his application, personal application onto the container. Um, uh, Billy Hood, who is our veteran um, and actually worked on the container unit with Jane Molfinger, um, the regrets project. Um, we, we actually, we have a local uh, uh, um, person in town who buys failed businesses, which is a very interesting material uh, experience to go into his warehouse and witness failed businesses residue. And so we got a lot of lumber and everything donated and out of that came a lot of creative um, enterprise using the existing materials that we were able to acquire from Craigslist, the dump, thrift shops, and, and so on. And I think the other important thing is that the containers were reuse, objects of reuse, and we felt as though we had to carry that through the entire project. So pretty much everything in that entire container is reuse. Um, we put in a Falls kitchenette only to kind of show that this could be a, it's actually 300 square feet, but it could be a single dwelling unit, you know, with a public uh, social space and a private space. And so here you have the raw kind of cut up and bolted together piece. And then we had to interiorize it. And for, of course, students, that was a lot more fun um, shredding clothes, used shred clothing, jeans, um, stuff from central stores that was discarded um, by the university. Um, we did a lot of experiments in insulation, uh, alternative insulation. Um, all the furniture was uh, reuse, uh, plywood as glue lam. We took scrap plywood from the wood shop and laminated it for the flooring. Um, Roberta Padilla, who is here, uh, actually took shipping pallets. Uh, and turn them into our decking, which I think is a really, has a lot of potential uh, application. Um, so, you know, excess. I think one of the things that really comes forth in the work that were, that came out of this project was um, the kind of central theme of consumption. The fact that there is so much material goods, containers and everything else, that are spewing into uh, the built environment um, what do we do with that? And, and in many respects, I, I don't allow any of my students to buy stuff new because we have such an excess of uh, available goods that are already there. And um, we got a barrel of corks and, uh, you know, and obviously the dump, um, I, uh, witnessing what goes to the dump or the landfills on a daily basis is um, kind of overwhelming. And the thought of putting one more thing in the world almost seems irresponsible. So all of the pieces and all the elements, this was a stereo um, home entertainment unit made out of cafeteria trays that were from the dormitory cafeteria that was closed down and all the trays were being tossed and this student actually configured a working uh, home entertainment unit. But I, I also, I think when you get into these practical environments as artists, you're always asking, where's the art? What is, how is art contributing to the dialogue, uh, the bigger, di the broader dialogue of, of, you know, reuse and consumption? And also, where am I as an artist in this whole process? The interesting thing is the same student, um, we had a student show at a gallery downtown, took that, that stereo, functional stereo unit and turned it into a minimalist uh, piece uh, for uh, an exhibition called Useless, which we, basically the theme was taking used elements and turning them into fine art. And um, these, the, here's the barrel of corks as a, as a 12, or I think it was 14 foot tower. Um, this is the whole installation, everything from, uh, you know, t-shirts to dryer lint. And, um, and then Koji Tanaka, who was central to working on the container, who's also here, um, wants to be an architect, designed a uh, bench that out of, you know, recycled wood and recycled metal. And miraculously, um, the show sold out. So uh, it was kind of a shock to the students that they started with useless elements and it transformed into very good market commodities. Um, even dryer lint, that sold for $400. Um, well, it was just one of those things where we had the opening and everybody there, I think, uh, subscribed to this idea of sustainability and green and reuse and the idea of student artwork. And there was just sort of this frenzy of 
wanting a piece of it. And, and I told the students it only goes down from here. <laughs> it doesn't get any better than selling out, you know, your first show. Um, so it, you saw that the furniture with the uh, thrift shop uh, stuffed animals, which are in abundance. In fact, I just I have an anecdote at, at thrift shops that says something about uh, the world of consumption. If I go to a thrift shop, which I do, and I decide I'm gonna, I need a bike helmet for my daughter, she's nine years old, I can go and actually find her size and the color she likes in a thrift shop, in a secondhand store. So we're starting to see this shift from department store inventory moving into you know, secondhand reuse. And, and, and actually the statistics on that are only less than 10% of the clothing that's, that's donated to thrift shops is actually in the thrift shops. The rest of it goes into landfills. Okay, so Art is trying to recuperate. So she also had a piece in the useless show that I bought. <laughs> um, and then she also did the furniture. So you're seeing this kind of interesting negotiation between the artist and the, the person in the world trying to, trying to engage it. Um, I just wanted to talk a little bit about Open Container 2, which was the mobile unit that you saw that's now Jane Mulfinger and uh, Billy Hood's project. Um, the Santa Barbara Museum of Art had a really amazing show on contemporary Chinese photography that actually visualized what's going on in China in terms of the rapidly changing landscape as a result of the global globalization. And what we did, and this is Billy Hood, um, in the middle of the night fabricating this display unit, we in a sense parasited off of that museum show by setting up our mobile unit in the back and doing a kind of alternative show in response to that one. And so this actual unit actually telescopes out into space and we did lighting and, and then, we, then what I did is I commissioned uh, artists, oh I have to put a plug in for Dick, <laughs> um, I just want to say because everyone keeps bringing up Marlon Brando and On the Waterfront, one of our exhibitions included uh, projecting on the waterfront on the outside of the, the containers. Um, the Longshoremen and Marlon Brando was part of our piece too. Um, but in terms of consumption, I, I just wanted to say that the artists that were in that show, uh, that mobile show, I, commit, I asked them for $100, they had to make work out of, uh, from either Walmart or the 99 cent store. What you're seeing below is um, um, Andreas Gursky's amazing photography of high density 99 cent stores. So the artists actually took on um, this idea of you know, the fact, the reason we have this glut and this sort of rapid consumption is because it is coming over from China and, and it can end up in a 99 cent store after making that passage for, you can buy something for less than a dollar. I mean, how does it get all the way from the factory in China, all the way over the ocean into a shop, the middleman making some money and we buy it for 99 cents? You know, you have to go back to the factory worker and there is indeed, um, a discrepancy in we're benefiting but what, what's happening back there. So what we did is we uh, actually screened, we made it also a micro cinema and we screened David Redmond's um, Mardi Gras Made in China which ties nicely into Katrina because um, he traces the Mardi Gras beads made in the factories in China all the way over into the streets of New Orleans and so there's that disconnect between the factory workers not having any idea what they were making the beads for, and then the, the, the street walkers at, at, uh, at um, New Orleans during the celebration pre-Katrina not knowing where they came from, and he actually showed each of them this video. Um, so we had that in a, as a cinema booth in the container project. We also had a student do a, um, a drawing exhibition, I mean a drawing, drawings by mail, where he would actually on the internet solicit people to ask for a drawing, any subject they want, and he would actually send them a hand-rendered drawing in exchange, and he opened it up to the public to actually illustrate people's requests as part of this container unit. So people could actually do a, a, a original drawing and it would be sent to the individual who requested it. Now, there you see Nelson Lichtenstein and Billy Hood uh, contemplating that container unit at the museum. And I think that's actually where this whole uh, collaborative effort of the arts and humanities and social sciences came together was the object provided this um, embodiment of the complexity of the container unit and Nelson, um, and Billy is from Porterville. So uh, many of you know that's a 
basically a Walmart um, uh, stronghold. And um, Nelson and Billy were in a conversation about uh, the possibility of a container conference, and now here, a year and a half later, we have it. So um, I think that was a really important moment. Um, Billy Hood, Jane Wolfring, and Graham Budget uh, are doing, now taking that unit, and they've modified it again, as you saw, uh, to have a mobile arts lab and doing transitory regrets, I titled that, um, to actually circulate the junior high schools and high schools all around Santa Barbara. So this unit will go to high schools and the students will actually engage actively in that process of regrets. And I think that'll be a very interesting um, um, passage of the, con of the container unit actually becoming a kind of satellite classroom space. And how are I doing on time? Okay, and then one more, uh, the, the, the the units that you saw down, downstairs, we've actually been lobbying campus planning here to actually uh, move them onto West Campus, which is our uh, other end of campus. Um, and I, I kind of see it as the arts end of campus in, in response to the nano end of campus the, uh, as a kind of, you know, um, other alternative a way into campus through the arts. Um, Ten of our graduate, our, our honor students had studio space in this building out on West Campus, and due to asbestos and mold and just age of the building, it was condemned and our students lost that space. So those units downstairs are actually being considered as interim temporary container units that could be used as student day studio space in the interim, as I said when, you know, the 30-year capital campaign uh, actually brings to fruition new studio spaces, probably longer. So uh, this is our Cameron Hall studio space is actually just locked up, still has water and power, and we envision parasiting onto the, the, the power and water grid of that closed unit, our new units. And that brings up this container competition. Um, I, I have to give credit to Holly Unruh, uh, Associate Director of the UCIRA, who really comes up with ways in, in which to sustain the relationships, the partnerships, and the, the kind of uh, depth of the projects we're doing. Now, we're on to almost two years of a project. And this is Billy Hood's SketchUp drawing of, uh, this is the competition units are the two very formal, um, this is, you know, whatever those two units will render and our units, and the idea is that we set up a kind of demonstration uh, site on West Campus. Um, and that's kind of the, the culmination is that we now throw it out into the public realm to have this competition continue what the students started. So open up the box. Thank you. It was partly my fault for taking five minutes at the beginning to do my little spiel, but we're running over time, so uh, I'm hoping it'd be okay for us to go like 15 over because we've compressed all this very uh, uh, concretely rich, you know, data rich, rich uh, art, present, art and architecture presentations into one panel. We should, clearly should have had another panel. But I hope it. Is Nelson here? Where's Nelson? Nelson's not here. Okay, well, we can do it then, yeah. Okay, let me start with the, uh, the alibis. As, as Dick said, I'm a kind of late substitute here for someone else. Uh, it isn't really my field. Uh, my background is media and communications, so I'm kind of an interloper here altogether. You might think of what I'm going to say maybe as something like a bit of a pirate radio you're picking up. You thought you were tuned to one channel and something starts breaking in and, you know, hopefully there were some echoes of the things you were hoping to listen to, but, you know, we might go to some other places as well. It's a little bit scattershot. It'll bleed back into previous panels, a little bit maybe into the next one, but I will in the end get to the question of housing. Um, why am I here at all? Well, in my field, all the talk is of digitalization, uh, the role of digitalization in creating the great new media industries of the global era by standardizing everything, films, information, television, newspapers, into digital bits, which crucially allows for the transposition of messages across different media platforms. 
And guess what? When I came across the containerization debate, I realized that it represented a very strong parallel insofar as the boxes played something like the same role in the transport industry as digitalization is playing in the communications industries, precisely in allowing the development of a standardized transmodal system for the transfer of the basic units across different parts of the system. There are a lot of the issues that are the same, like we were hearing yesterday about the struggles about the sizes of the box. Well, in my field, one of the struggles was formats, the VHS as opposed to the Betamax format. Standard laws are part of the terrain, it seems, in both fields. We're finding the same debates about the role of technology development as against the role of regulatory systems. Just like yesterday's debate about whether it was the invention of the box itself and or the changes in regulatory systems, crucially the deregulation attendant upon globalization, which have had the principal causal effects. In the same way, in communication studies, we all now spend our time debating whether it was the specific technical process of digitalization which has changed things, or, for instance, the changes in regulatory systems in the UK, where I work. We now have lots of multi-cross media companies, but it's not at all clear that it was the technological change per se which was the big issue, as opposed to the deregulation of the UK media laws which had previously outlawed such patterns of integrated media ownership under anti-monopoly legislation. Without that change in the anti-monopoly laws, the technical capacity for cross-modal development within the media would have been inconsequential. So how do we proceed? So how do we proceed? We need to move to more complex models of the dynamics between the technological innovation in stake, invention and implementation, acting in consort and sometimes in contradiction to regulatory systems, such as the model kind of developed by people like Bruno Latour in the sociology and anthropology of technology studies. So I'm looking across the interface of communications and transport studies at a time when communication studies itself generally focuses simply and exclusively on the movement of information, forgetting that in its classical definition, communications referred to the movement of people and of goods as much as the movement of information. My personal aim is to reintegrate transport studies within the field of communications, returning to the classical definition of the field. One helpful model here is that supplied by the anthropologist of globalization, Arjuna Pajurai, who argues for the need to study the interaction of what he calls mediascapes, ethnoscapes, financescapes, and technoscapes, or put another way, the movement of information, people, and goods from the perspectives of economics, demography, and geography. In doing this, the ambition would also be to study more closely the integration of the virtual with the actual. For instance, in relation to containerization, the key role of the articulation of the computer technology in guiding and enabling the physical process of the loading and unloading of ships. But if containerization has to be understood in the broader context of changes in regulatory systems and the process of globalization, then it's worth thinking for a moment about what's involved in those discourses. My own interest as I've said, span both the symbolic and material dimensions of communications, and thus both the literal and metaphorical dimensions of containerization. And I think David Marshall's opening comments on metaphor were very apposite to our discussions. In this context, I want also to return to a metaphor which I think it was Nelson who used yesterday, who spoke of containers, I hope I got this right, as rather like the red blood cells transporting vital nutrients through the sinews of the body economic. What's interesting to me here is that when we speak like this of the vital importance of circulatory flows, is that we implicitly then go back to the discourse of Turgot and the physiocrats of 18th century France who argued, of course, that as Nelson indicated in his rapid history of transport revolutions, the key role of transport, canals, railways, roads, in the constitution of the nation state. Nowadays, of course, our focus is not on the nation, but on transnational flows in the global economy. However, the unregarded constant in our discourse is the presumption that improved or faster flows are per se good 
and that what they principally distribute literally are goods. What I don't want to preempt the concerns of the next panel too much, but we do perhaps need to concentrate more on the role of transportation flows in the distribution of bads, however defined, waste, drugs, illegal migrants, unrecordable flows of cash. And given the scale of the black economy, we can't treat this as just some kind of add-on supplementary issue. Indeed, it seems to me that what we increasingly see around us is not principally a process of globalization, deregulation, the collapse of borders, or the technologically assisted euthanasia of ge geography, but rather in response to the contradictions of globalization, an increasing tendency towards renationalization, re-territorializing, re-territorialization and re-regulation. Uh, the simplest example, and forgive me anyone who heard me talk about this earlier in the week, is perhaps the way in which in response to the increasing levels of credit card fraud which globalization has given rise to, so many French petrol stations nowadays have a little sign on their pumps saying French credit cards only. When I see little things like that, I do wonder about the prescience of Michael Winterbottom's dystopian representation of the future in his film Code 409, a future in which all movement is tightly regulated by one-off combined passport insurance documents, and most people are relegated to an undocumented sector in which any movement is illegal, the ultimate form of re-territorialization. This is to speak of the contradictions within the process of globalization. And what other, one other dimension of those contradictions, to turn finally to something closer to the proper topic of this panel, concerns the relationship between these processes as seen from above and from below. So yesterday, uh, we heard, for instance, from Jennifer, a fabulous account of innovative professional approaches to the use of containers in architecture, just as we've heard this afternoon. But we do also need to pay attention to the emerging practices of those who, through force of circumstances, have to use recycled, reclaimed materials to make their houses. I'm thinking here of phenomena like the Geki Kondu self-build settlements created by the poor in cities like Istanbul, as represented, for instance, in the work of novelists like Latifi Tekins, anybody who knows her tales from the garbage hills, for instance, or Kutlug Ataman's video installation telling the story of the lives of the inhabitants of the once utopian shanty town known as Kuba in the outlying Kurdish district of Istanbul. My point here is that, again, just as I argued in relation to the circulation of bads, this is not a story which could be treated as some kind of minor key postscript to the main story of the global city. As is demonstrated in Rem Koolhaas and his colleagues' studies of places like Lagos, these self-build, self-help, unregulated shanty towns, largely built out of the waste products of global flows, can no longer be seen as adjuncts to the city proper. Rather, these places should force us to reconsider our very idea of what a city is and how it comes to be built. We tend to think of cities as displaying not only size, but as necessarily having a particular set of attributes, wealth, good facilities, sound infrastructure, as if the latter were the necessary precondition of the former. However, the simple fact is that most of the world's fastest growing cities have none of these attributes. Indeed, Tokyo will soon be the only rich city in the list of the world's 10 largest. Among the fastest growing cities, places like Mumbai and Lagos, growth is occurring without widespread industrialization, infrastructure provision, or formal job creation. What were once considered to be the necessary preconditions of planned urban growth have in these places been replaced, just as in the Geki Kondu settlements I spoke of, on a much larger scale by informal, unplanned, self-build, self-help networks. As Kulhas and his colleagues put it, these are places that invert every essential characteristic of the so-called modern city. They are not becoming modern in any conventional sense, but perhaps represent paradigmatic case studies of cities at the forefront of globalizing modernity. They are not catching up with the West, Rather, they may show the West the conditions of its own possible future. To put 
the point more colloquially and to return to some of the phenomena that Dick was talking about in the introduction uh, to the session. A friend of mine who works for the European Bank of Reconstruction and Development and spends much of his time visiting mining camps and oil fields in Central Asia regularly tells me stories of whole townships and large-scale marketplaces been built entirely out of disused containers. And even more interestingly, of how, within these townships, residential hierarchies are rapidly being reinvented as the standardized form of the container is customized and adopted, just as we saw today at lunchtime, in all kinds of innovative ways. A testament, perhaps, to what Michel de Certeau once called the capacity of the weak to poach advantage on and from the strategic territories of the powerful. 